used the other day, Womp Bitter. But then I took a step back. Not literally, of course, but I really thought about it. And I came to the conclusion that nothing in life really matters. Here's why. The Earth has been around for four and a half billion years. One day, humans became a thing, and we became conscious. This world seemed perfect for us. It wasn't scorching hot, it wasn't deathly cold. We fit right in the middle. The gravity on Earth was perfect. It allowed us to move and run and catch animals that conveniently existed for us humans to eat. There was water to drink, there was oxygen to breathe. It's as if we were put here for a reason. We began creating things, we began working together as a species, building empires, covering the planet, and fighting each other for whatever reason. Fast forward a couple million years and here we are today. Computers, rockets, Elon Musk, they're all here. Somewhere along the line, we also, in a way, created something out of nothing. It's called time. We've laid out definitions of time, seconds, minutes, hours, years, but it doesn't really matter. We made those for our own use. Time is nothing more than a way to measure the passing of events. But we've only really set up these units of time based off of ourselves. A day is how long it takes the Earth to spin around once. A month is about how long it takes the moon to orbit the Earth, and also spin around once. A year is how long it takes the Earth to orbit the sun once. You get about 78 Earth revolutions around the sun in this journey called life. As poetic as that sounds, there's not much scale to these things once we pass a human lifetime. Sure, we can judge how long a thousand, or maybe even ten thousand years are. But after that, the timescales of things are just too much for our brains to handle. As much as you think you understand the 13.8 billion year lifespan of the universe, you really can't put that into an imaginable scale. On the scale of a human life, the universe is unbelievably old. But in terms of the universe's lifespan, pretty much nothing has happened yet. It's barely even started. We can make predictions about the next hundreds of trillions of years of the universe's life. We can figure out how and when our sun is going to blow up. We can figure out when our galaxy is going to collide with another. We can come up with theories that describe why the universe we've been put into is expanding faster than anything else physically possible. But yet, we have zero idea what happened in the fraction of a second between when there was nothing and when there was something. For some reason, as far as we can tell, we're the only conscious beings to have ever existed. But we don't even know what being conscious is. We developed consciousness only to be aware of the fact that nothing else is. We've grown so aware of our surroundings that the smarter we get, the smaller we become. As this thing we call time goes on, we begin to realize things. Things that prove that the universe probably wasn't made just for us. You were most likely born in a hospital. If not, props to you for making it this far. Back then, you were your parents' entire world for a small time. Which is cute. But you aren't everything. 360,000 people are born each day. Of all of those people with the same birthday, some are gonna do big things and change the world. Others are just... gonna die. That just happens. But Earth is just one planet. In our solar system, there's eight. Or nine of those. For now, for life as we know it to exist, it's kinda hard to believe that there might be other life out there. It takes so much to happen for us to be able to exist. We've discovered over 4,000 exoplanets to date, planets that don't revolve around our sun, and we've found multiple examples of Earth-like planets. Roughly the same shape, size, temperature, but yet, there's nothing there from what we can tell. So if there are so many planets that could have life, why haven't we seen it yet? Why are there no signs? Well, we're just one solar system in an entire galaxy. There's over 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone. But that's just one galaxy. We're a part of the local group, which is a collection of 30 galaxies near our own. Andromeda is one of them. That's the one that's going to collide with our galaxy in about 4.5 billion years. By then, you'll be long gone. And soon after that, so will the Earth. The Sun at this point will be reaching the end of its life. It's going to expand in size, and by the end, it will completely consume the Earth, shining over 3,000 times brighter than it does today. But even though our home planet will be gone, the rest of the galaxy wouldn't even notice. Billions of years on a multi-trillion year timescale is truly nothing. But even so, 
there are some things that we're observing in the universe's infancy today that will drastically influence the far future. To keep it short, the universe is expanding. This is nothing new. A lot of people know this, but what many people don't know is that this expansion is speeding up. Now, we don't know why, but we have an idea of what's causing it. Dark energy. I made an entire video about this, so go watch that after. This dark energy is stretching the fabric of space-time. We don't know what it's made from, we know it's there, we observe its results, but we don't know exactly what it is, or what it's going to do. Dark energy, at least according to our current calculations, will eventually stretch the space-time between galaxies faster than the speed of light. The light emitting from our neighboring galaxies will travel towards us at the fastest speed possible, but even this won't be enough. The light will never reach us because the space between it is stretching faster than the light that is traveling through it. It will spread the universe so thin with galaxies that, when we look out to observe what's around us, we won't see anything. We're going to end up all alone, confined to whatever galaxy we end up in. But in the end, even our galaxy will start to go dark. The fate of the sun is the same as it is for all stars in the universe. Eventually, trillions of years down the road, these lights in the sky are going to begin turning off, one by one by one. Without any new stars to keep things running, the universe is going to get a bit colder. Depending on their size, these dying stars begin to turn into white dwarfs or neutron stars, providing the last glimmers of light in a cold and dark universe. This is the very last hope for any surviving life forms in the universe, but eventually, trillions of more years after the last stars like our sun die, even these white dwarfs will begin to dim out. Some of these neutron stars roaming throughout the universe may collide by chance, resulting in the brightest known events in the entire universe. Supernovae. But once these supernovae conclude, the universe is again plunged into darkness. All matter that used to make up the galaxies we see today will begin to fall into the black holes that kept things held together for so long. The Big Bang that created the highest temperatures ever known to physics ultimately results in the most dormant, dark, and cold configuration possible. From a universe teeming with light and beauty, to a cold, barren wasteland. A universe dominated by black holes. But even now, the universe has just begun. These black holes are going to be around for a while, and the things we used to call galaxies, with stars and planets and life, are now just going to be full of black holes, black holes, and more black holes. This is how the universe is going to spend most of its time. Cold, dark, and alone. We're no longer talking about millions of years here. The timescales are now on quadrillions of years. But even these black holes won't last forever. Through Hawking radiation, these black holes will slowly, very slowly, begin to evaporate away, one subatomic particle at a time, until eventually, after all the black holes fade out of existence, there is nothing left in the universe. A universe where nothing changes, where time becomes pointless. There's nothing. The nothingness of space, though, will continue to expand because of dark energy, a force that accounts for 70% of our universe that we don't even completely understand yet. Matter as we know it today, the things that make up everything you see, only accounts for barely 4% of the stuff in the universe. So maybe, just maybe, we're a fluke. We were never supposed to make it to the end, but we still have a role to play out today. We are one species on one planet, in one galaxy, in an almost indistinguishable part of the universe. Whether or not we came to exist, not much would be different. Every day we matter a little less, and a little less, until eventually we realize that, in the grand scheme of things, we don't matter at all. Our galaxy could just disappear. It wouldn't really change much. We came to exist in such a weird time. But it's also pretty unique. We know we're just the beginning, a blip in the universe's potential. But the only way to fulfill that potential is to start making progress today. It's not a stretch to say that there won't be others like us. Random spurts of intelligent life spread throughout trillions of trillions of years. But now, we're at one of those stages where life is possible. And probably the easiest it's ever going to be. 
you get one life to do whatever you want. There are some things you can avoid, like school, or taxes. But other than that, you're free to do mostly whatever you'd like. If we can't figure out our purpose for coming to exist on this planet, if we can't figure out why or how the universe came into being, then our purpose is whatever we want it to be. If you want to sit around and play games all day, there are people doing that. If you want to build a multi-billion dollar company that's going to help propel humanity to other worlds, there are people doing that as well. Anything you want to be or do can be done, and should be done. Like I said, our own purpose is whatever we want. Right now, if good things are happening to you, if bad things are happening to you, it's actually not going to last forever. You have zero idea what the future holds for you, and the most random of experiences can reroute your future in an instant. Everyone was dealt a hand in life that we honestly just didn't ask for. Some people's hands are better than others, but we all have to play with the cards we've been given in the best way we can. There's a chance that we humans may never figure out why everything in the universe acts the way it does. Is there life anywhere else? Or are we the exception? For every answer, a hundred new questions pop up. There's infinite possibilities as to how we came to exist, but there's infinitely just as many things to do while we're figuring that out. There's dogs to feed, there's people to meet, there's science to be done. So whatever you do while we figure out our spot in the universe, this universe at least, just try to enjoy it. Because no matter what happens to you, no matter how many times you mess up, no matter how far humanity ventures out into the unknown, in the end, <laughs> it doesn't even matter. In 1970, a British mathematician named John Conway created a project known as the Game of Life. Even though it's a game, it isn't one that you necessarily play. The Game of Life is a zero-player game, which doesn't make much sense when you hear it. The way it works is, you put in a set of initial conditions and then observe. That's it. Once you put the initial conditions in, the game runs itself. Other than the small set of rules that the simulation follows, it runs on almost nothing. Some patterns only run for a few generations before they die out, while others seemingly go on forever. And this got me thinking. If a simulation as small as this with very little variables can result in something huge, what if we scale this up to say the size of a universe? A simulation that's more than just dots on a screen, but a simulation with galaxies, planets, and life. More importantly, if that is possible, how do we know that we aren't living in one of those simulations right now? At first, the argument for our universe being a simulation just sounds like complete nonsense. But when you actually take a look into it, it seems to become more and more plausible. How do you observe things? Well, you see them, or smell them, or observe them with any of your senses. This is your subjective reality. A reality based on a subject. You. You are alone in your own head. Everything that you observe or interact with ends its journey with neurons firing in your brain in a certain way to create your view of the world. With this being said, can you prove that there is an objective reality? That is, a reality that exists independently of our knowledge of it. A sort of overarching reality that encompasses all of our subjective realities. It exists without our observation of it. That sounds kinda confusing though. You can't know that an objective reality exists without someone or something to observe it. For example, if I went outside and stated that it was freezing, and you went outside and stated that it was scorching hot, that is where our subjective realities come into play. From this, it seems that two different minds, two different people, can observe a single object in multiple ways. In an objective reality, it would just be either freezing or just scorching, regardless of either one of our observations. In an objective reality, in order to prove something exists, you would have to observe it without observing it which is an obvious contradiction. This kinda begs the question, can you prove that anything outside of your own mind is actually... real? Babies aren't exactly the smartest things in the world, but they do give us a good insight into how we learn, how our minds develop, and how we become aware of the world around us. If you look outside your window, you might see a tree, or another house, or maybe your car in the driveway. 
but you don't need to physically look out there to know that those things exist. This is known as object permanence. It is the knowledge that objects exist even when we aren't perceiving them in any way. However, we aren't born with the skill. It's something that is developed over time. I'm sure you've seen or even played peekaboo with a baby before. When you cover your face, babies less than about a year old will believe that you've disappeared into thin air. But when you take your hands away, you're back. Back into their reality. The knowledge that things exist even when you can't observe them isn't learned until about one and a half to two years into life. But is that actually true? This goes back to your subjective reality. Sure, after a while you might learn that some things seem to exist when we aren't observing them, but how can you be certain? At the end of the day, it is just your subjective reality. It's due to your consciousness that you can even observe anything. Take this for example. When you look at your computer or phone or television or whatever device you're watching this on, you know that all of those things are composed of atoms. But you can't really see them, can you? It's not until we take a device such as a microscope to observe them that we can actually see these atoms that make up everything. We can't see them until they're observed closely. So if this is true, this can make simulating a universe a million times easier. Simulating an entire universe with billions of galaxies over billions of light years would take up a lot of computing power and would really just be a waste. All a post-human species would have to do is just simulate the consciousness of its subjects. Or maybe even subject. Is there any way to prove that anyone you talk to on a daily basis isn't just another function of code in the simulation? All the simulation has to do is just trick you into believing the world around you is real. When you play video games, you'll notice that things don't render in completely when you aren't looking at them. It's a waste of power and energy. Since video games are basically simulations of our own, why wouldn't the simulated universe follow a similar strategy? It's a very arrogant statement coming from a human, but hear me out. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? It's a pretty popular psychological question, and it fits really well here. In a simulated universe, if no one is around or conscious of that even taking place, there's no reason for it to make a sound, or for the tree to even fall in the first place. If we stumbled upon that tree later on, it would just be lying on the ground to give the illusion that it fell. If we aren't observing galaxies in the Hubble Deep Field, what's the point of them existing in the simulation at all times? It can be possible that just bits and pieces of what we call the universe exist and are observed at a single time. If we look back at where technology was 100 years ago and compare it to now, you can see an obvious difference. If technology continues to advance at any rate that's greater than zero, then it is possible that in the future, whether it be 100 or 1 million years, that we will eventually have technology with near unlimited computing power. But all I keep talking about is power and energy. How would a civilization even get this kind of power? Remember those creepy Russian dolls that when you open them up, there's another doll inside and then another and another? There's a concept that's basically that, but on a stellar scale. Take our sun for example. It's really big and really hot and it radiates a ton of energy. If we could somehow harness all of that energy, we could use it to simulate millions of universes simultaneously. But how are we supposed to gather all that energy? Using a little something called matryoshka brains. If an advanced civilization was able to build a megastructure encompassing the sun in multiple layers, just like the dolls, they would have all of the sun's energy at their disposal. A civilization capable of this could most likely do this with multiple stars, and thus will be able to simulate as many universes as they'd like. We can run simulations on our own computers that project our universe on a large scale. The Illustrious Project does this very well. Just like the Game of Life, the project is much like a zero-player game. The scientists who created the project gave it certain properties that match our universe near the beginning and then just let it run. It's able to project our universe on a large scale very accurately, actually. And that's just with the computing power we have today. In the future, simulations like these will get more and more accurate until eventually, it may even be realistic. However, it cannot be perfect. When we observe atoms and attempt to view electrons or other particles, we cannot know both the position and momentum of these particles with 100% certainty. This is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. There's a limit to what we can know about the mass, energy, position, and time of a particle. Meaning that in any simulation, there is no way to accurately represent everything exactly as it was. You can never truly have a perfect simulation of reality. It will always be slightly slower than the actual reality itself, even with an infinite amount of computational power at your disposal. 
In order to combat this, limits have to be put in place. Tricks and sleight of hand have to be used. A good example is this. If you have an old computer and try to run the newest games on it with 20 Google Chrome tabs open while also listening to music, you'll see an obvious decline in your computer's performance. The old computer doesn't have the computing power necessary to handle all of that strain, so it slows down. Now, think of black holes. When you're around that much matter in one place, that much information in one spot, time literally slows down. It's as if whoever created the simulation slowed down parts of the simulation to keep the energy required low. Could this be an explanation for the speed of light? Could this be the speed of computation of whatever simulation we may be in? There's no way to tell and all of this is theoretical, and to be honest, insane. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't think about it. It could actually help answer some of the most sought out questions we ask. For example, the Fermi Paradox. When we look out into the universe, we don't see any other signs of life. Are we really alone? Are we just a glitch in the simulation, or are we just not looking hard enough? Take the creatures that exist at the bottom of our oceans. Are they aware that we humans even exist? Are they aware of anything outside of their immediate vicinity? Do they know that they're living on a big rock floating around a hot ball of gas orbiting some big black hole of death in the center of the galaxy that sucks anything and everything in? Probably not. What if we're just like those creatures, but the furthest that we can observe or are aware of is what we call the observable universe? Perhaps the universe cannot exist without conscious minds to observe it. The idea of simulated universes could also explain the multiverse theory. The idea of a multiverse is just that, multiple universes, or perhaps infinite universes. In many situations when there's a high chance of someone getting killed or someone has a near-death experience, they are reported to have said that their life flashed before their eyes. Their most special moments and memories from their life all comes rushing back to them in an instant. Researchers from Hadassah University in Jerusalem analyzed multiple cases of people who experienced these near-death experiences. In almost all of these cases, those being interviewed stated that they had lost all sense of time. One of them wrote, There is not a linear progression, there is a lack of time limits. It was like being there for centuries. It happened all at once, or some experiences within my near-death experience were going on at the same time as others, though my human mind separates them into different events. Another respondent stated, I could individually go into each person and feel the pain that they had in their life. I was allowed to see that part of them and feel for myself what they felt. When people experienced these things, it was as if they were living another life. They experienced things they never felt before. It was as if they stepped foot into an alternate reality. The idea of time didn't exist for a short while, and they were able to analyze things that no other living person could do. When you're talking with a friend and have that weird deja vu feeling that you've had the same conversation before, or that you've experienced exactly what they're feeling without actually having been through it, perhaps you, in another universe or another simulation, actually had that same thing happen to you. The illusion of free will allows us to live our lives in any way we see fit. But what if every single decision that you've ever made has been pre-programmed into the simulation that we could exist in? Every decision you make branches you off into a parallel universe, a parallel simulation, where every choice that you have ever made has led you to this exact very moment. At home, on your phone, watching this very video. Current technology already greatly surpasses human performance and speed. That's why many big companies like Tesla use robots and other machines to do jobs that humans can't do as effectively. Biological neurons, those are the neurons that fire in your brain every second of the day, operate at a peak speed of about 200 hertz, whereas modern microprocessors operate at at least 2 gigahertz, a whole 7 orders of magnitude faster. Even with modern technology, a super intelligent AI, for example, a human mind that runs on hardware faster than the brain, could make decisions millions of times faster than current humans would. It would be able to think of every outcome and pick from the best ones. However, we are not super intelligent AI. There is a limit to what the human brain can do, can observe. We have, though, made some very important discoveries that keep us asking questions. Most importantly, math. Math seems universal. There are numbers and patterns in things from the size of atoms to things the size of galaxies. Discoveries that we humans have made in only the past couple thousand years have allowed us to ask crazy questions like, are we living in a simulation? If we were to put every single one of the possible billions of simulations into a hat, jumbled them around and picked one out, 
what are the chances that we will grab the original one? The one who made all the simulations in the first place? What are the chances that the Earth we're living on even exists? Perhaps an advanced alien species came upon our dead planet after billions of years and found traces of our DNA, traces of our existence, and then made a simulation out of that to learn about the history of the barren wasteland of a planet they had just stumbled upon. If that's the case, then hello. We can never know for sure. All we can do is observe and hope that our game of life is one that we can win. If I steal from the rich and feed to the poor, is that good or bad? If I drive over the speed limit to get my sick child to the hospital, is that good or is that bad? What is good and what is bad? What is morality and do you, as a person, have morals? Morality is what society treats as right and acceptable. They're the standards of thoughts, behaviors, and actions that everyone in a group agrees to follow so that they can all live peacefully. When you define it like that, morality does sound like law. However, while the law is influenced by morals, they're not the same. Stealing is against the law. Whether you're stealing from the rich or from the poor, stealing is a crime. However, a lot of people would consider stealing a piece of bread to save a homeless person from dying of hunger moral. Driving over the speed limit is a crime, but when it could help save the life of a child in the backseat of your car, it becomes the most noble of actions. Trespassing is a crime, but when there's a storm coming and you don't have anywhere to go, hiding under the shade of someone's porch will definitely not get you in society's black book. On the flip side, there are also some things that are considered immoral, but are not criminal. Cheating on a test is a crime, but cheating on a partner is not. However, both of them would most likely be considered immoral. Breaking a promise is one of the most immoral things you can do, but unless it was a written agreement about a business contract, you normally won't get into trouble with the law for it. Although law and morality are different, they're quite similar in many ways actually. Both morality and law are built on the foundation of respect for all humans as well as the autonomy of life, property, and beliefs. They're also both there to guide the behaviors of people living in a community so everyone can live together in the most peaceful ways possible. Just that one is written and the other is usually unspoken. I made an entire video about unspoken rules in society, and most of them are simply our moral obligations as members of that society. More often than not, the law expresses the morality of that time and place. Just a few years ago, it was illegal to smoke weed almost anywhere in the United States. However, as morality shifted towards tolerance for people to enjoy it, so did the law. Now whether they did that for moral reasons or simply because they can tax it at a pretty high rate is a different discussion entirely, but anyways. As humans evolve and learn new things, our morals change. This is why morality isn't stagnant. It evolves with time as people share their experiences and beliefs about the world. Think about issues like premarital sex, same-sex relationships, abortion, marijuana use. These are all things that were considered immoral long ago, but today, society is beginning to accept all of these as moral. We've learned to be tolerant of people regardless of their personal beliefs or preferences, and while not everyone might agree to all of these things or practice it themselves, Things seem to have flipped, and it's now considered immoral to criticize the people who choose to live these lifestyles. Throughout human history, morality tended to have been tied to religious traditions. However, now more than ever, we're moving to a place where morality is no longer tied to religion whatsoever. It's more of what the social norm is, and how you operate around that social norm. We now recognize the need for secular morality that transcends people's personal beliefs and is instead seeking the good of the general public. However, there is one argument against this type of morality. The idea of subjective morality. You see, there have always been debates about whether morality is subjective or objective, usually in religious or philosophical spheres. People who believe that morality is objective often say that if morality becomes subjective, everyone can simply create their own morality and then we can never say that they're wrong about anything. Because who are we to say that their own definition of morality 
isn't the right one. And while there is some truth in that, there still are of course many flaws in that argument. If morality is objective, there needs to be substantial similarities in what every culture considers correct and acceptable, as well as actions that are also considered taboo universally. But it is almost impossible to find a moral issue that every culture in the world agrees to, even murder. Think about Nazi Germany and how it was thought of as moral to kill in that culture. Think about cultures that practice cannibalism, or still make human sacrifices to their deity to this day. If even the most barbaric of actions aren't considered barbaric in every culture, how can we possibly say that morality is objective? Another problem with the argument of objective morality is that for morality to be objective, it has to be defined by an outside entity, in other words, a god, or at least something that is hard-coded into all of us as humans. But in that case, most religions do not agree on the rules that have been given by their god. In fact, even within religions, not everyone agrees to or follows the same set of rules. So how do we then determine which group of people are right about what is wrong? When people think of objective morality, what they're actually talking about is cosmopolitan morality. Because the world is now so connected, we're more open to new and diverse experiences. Experiences that are helping us shape a new definition of morality. One that we can all agree on. But as we've seen in the past, getting everyone to agree on something is relatively impossible. This type of morality only exists on the internet biggest cosmopolitan metropolis. But when you step outside and look into the real world, into the billions of people that are not connected to the internet, you'll be met with a vast difference in what is considered right and what is considered wrong. Delphi, named after the ancient Greek oracle, is a simple artificial intelligence system that has been designed to make moral and ethical judgments. The Allen Institute built Delphi to answer one question. Can machines learn morality? On the surface, it might seem like a simple question with a straightforward answer, but research done on Delphi says otherwise. Delphi was once accessed by a group of human judges, and they determined that her ethical judgments were around 92% correct. Correct being decisions that humans are likely to make in the same scenario. When Delphi was released into the wild via the internet, a lot more people agreed with what these human judgments thought of Delphi. Yes, she wasn't perfect, but even humans aren't perfect moral beings. As we gain new experiences and begin to understand the life and struggles of others, we learn more and become wiser in our judgments. But you see, there are two main problems with Delphi and other AI systems like her. First, because Delphi was created by humans, she can quickly become as flawed and prejudiced as the people who created her. The creators of Delphi were ones who chose the ethical scenarios that would be used in the system. They also chose the people who would judge these scenarios. This means that, at least, in part, Delphi is a product of the morality of her creators. So until we can find a way to eradicate the prejudices that currently exist in our world, whatever AI we create will continue to express those thoughts. But this time, we won't have anyone to hold accountable. Secondly, you see, morality is not just critical analysis. Morality is intertwined with emotion, attachments between friends, partners, parents, and children, these are the foundations on which morality stands. Take away the emotions, and all you're left with is critical analysis, and decision making based on cost and reward. And this is simply not morality. This is why when Delphi was asked, is it right to leave one's body to science, she responded with yes. On paper, the benefits outweigh the cost. But it is only when we look at it through a lens of both emotions and logical reasoning that we realize that human life is far greater than any benefit, especially when there are other explorable options. More and more, we're seeing lawyers defend their cases using MRI scans and the neurology side of morality. Because let's say a certain person was making life decisions while at the same time having a massive brain tumor affecting their thought processes. If the person was not capable of making a moral decision due to medical conditions beyond their knowledge, can we even blame them for their actions? Morality is a function of the brain. If the area of the brain just behind the forehead, inches away from the eyes, gets damaged, a person's moral judgment can completely change. Their moral judgment, especially in life or death situations, becomes warped. They're willing to take a life as long as it's done to save another. In a study, 
People with this type of injury were willing to strangle a baby, as long as it would save someone else's life. It's vile and unthinkable to you because you feel compassion, guilt, and embarrassment. But when the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for creating these emotions, is damaged, so is your moral compass. Without the emotional system being in place, we're just like Delphi, left only with the ability to make utilitarian cost-benefit analyses. So as long as we're saving one life, taking another seems completely fair. Only when you look at it through the eyes of compassion, through the lens of morality, do you realize it's immoral and barbaric. So if morality can be affected by our biological makeup, what is morality? Biological or cultural? In truth, it's both. Biologically, what distinguishes us from other animals is our ability to make moral judgments. And this ability is down to three things. We can anticipate the consequences of our actions, we can make value judgments, and we can choose between alternative courses of action. These three things work together to give us the ability to make moral decisions. However, while the ability to make moral decisions is biological, moral codes of conduct are strictly culture, built out of the need to cohabit successfully. That's why every culture has its own morality. It's a complex thing. Just like every human is on a different journey of life, we are all guided on that journey by different moral compasses. This is why morality is a difficult subject to talk about. Because no matter what you say, there will always be some people that disagree with you. What some people consider moral, others consider immoral. What some people consider justice, others think of as revenge. But getting everyone to agree on a set of guidelines to follow should not be the only end goal of talking about morality. Because while we might not get all the answers we want or a clear path we should all follow, discussions on morality, how it's formed, and how it affects us, can give us a look into the lives of others and give us insight on how we should live our own. It helps us learn how others think, why they act the way they do, and why some people fight forcefully against certain ideas and beliefs and hold on dearly to some others. Talking about morality, in a sense, makes us all more moral because it teaches us why we are the way we are and how we can improve upon that. Morality is not measured in absolutes, but fractions of different pieces from different places that make up the whole pie we have come to know as humanity. In 1952, an author named Ray Bradbury published a short story called A Sound of Thunder. In it, a hunter named Eccles pays $10,000 to travel with Time Safari, a time machine company that takes hunters back to the time of dinosaurs and allows them to hunt the T-Rex. The company guarantees nothing, neither your safety nor your return, and there are strict instructions and expectations for how the hunters should behave once they travel back in time. When they travel 60 million years back in time, they notice the path that has been laid by the company. It floats 6 inches above the earth and is the only path that the hunter should travel upon. They cannot touch anything during their stay in the past, and they are only to shoot when told to. Interrupting any of the natural processes in the past could have irreparable repercussions for the future. Step on a mouse, and you leave your print, like the Grand Canyon, across eternity. They're very careful with leaving the past just as it was supposed to unfold. The T-Rex that they were supposed to kill was going to be crushed by a tree only seconds later. It was going to die anyway. Eccles, however, is terrified and runs back to the time machine through the jungle and waits for the others. But once the rest of the crew returns, they notice the mud on Knuckles' boots. Against their better judgment, they allow him to return with the crew back to present day. When they exit the time machine, the crew checks in with the man behind the desk to see if everything is okay, and the man tells him it is. The man, however, is acting a bit different from before they left. There's a strange smell in the air, it's faint, but it's there. The sign on the wall is different, the words were spelled differently. Eccles sits down and checks every inch of his body for things he could have ruined. And on his boot, caked in the mud, he finds a butterfly. Beautiful and dead. The death of a single butterfly has somehow resulted in the future being changed. He cries out in disbelief, begging to return to the past and somehow undo what he's done. He sits down with his eyes closed and senses a crew member enter the room. The crew member breathes loudly and takes the safety off his rifle. Eccles opens his eyes, but suddenly, all he hears is a sound of thunder. Do 
used to be thought that events that changed the world were things like big bombs, huge earthquakes, or other large-scale events. But it has now been realized that this is a very old-fashioned view held by people totally out of touch with modern thought. The things that changed the world are the tiny things. A butterfly flapped its wings in the Amazon, and subsequently a storm ravages half of Europe. Paraphrased a little bit is a quote from a novel named Good Omens. What it's talking about is the butterfly effect. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions, more commonly known as the butterfly effect, is the idea that a small change in any situation could have huge implications later on down the road. The idea was coined by Edward Lorenz in the 1950s. Lorenz was a meteorologist who was searching for a means of predicting the weather. He was conducting experiments with various numbers to try and model a weather prediction. He did a previous experiment with an initial condition of 0.506127, six significant digits, a little bit overkill he thought, so this time his initial condition was only 0.506. Three significant digits should be fine. So he left the room to get a cup of coffee and came back to something drastically different from what he had previously. At first things seemed normal and they seemed to follow the first experiment one to one. But after a while they started to diverge and looked like completely different models. A 0.03% difference in values had enormous long-term implications. It may seem insignificant, it's just a model, right? Well, Lorenz had actually just opened the door to a new way of thinking and seeing the world around us. Chaos theory is the branch of mathematics that focuses on exactly this kind of thinking, but its name is kind of deceiving. The butterfly effect doesn't represent chaos, but rather the effects of changing the slightest conditions and then observing the results. Think of this. It is easier to predict the orbital period of a planet in another star system 10 million years from now than it is for us to predict our own weather here on Earth just a month from today. Because in order for us to predict the weather long term, we would have to know the exact position and momentum of every molecule of air on the planet and how they interact with each other. For planetary orbits, it's just a lot easier, there's a lot less variables. Any university physics student could probably calculate it. As for the weather, a butterfly flapping its wings creates a minuscule and almost unnoticeable change in atmospheric pressure. But these changes compound over and over and over as time progresses, until, as widely known, the butterfly's wings cause a tornado in Texas. This inevitable growth of errors is called deterministic chaos, chaos that can be determined, measured. However, the butterfly itself cannot cause a tornado. The butterfly represents an unknowable quantity. We can never reverse engineer an event to find out what exactly tipped the system, there's just too many factors that could have gone into it. No choice you've ever made has been an isolated event. It's like a domino effect that keeps compounding over time. The world and society is like a network, and when a certain part of that network fails, it affects everything else. Chaos theory isn't random, even though it seems like it. To prove it, let's play chaos game. Take a piece of paper and make three points like such. We'll label them A, B, and C. Now, choose a random point in the middle of those three points. We'll just put it right here. Now, all you have to do is make a point halfway between your starting point and point A. From this point, make a point halfway between here and point B. Repeat the process for point C and continue this pattern, rotating between points A, B, and C. If you do this for long enough, you'll see something interesting start to happen. As more and more generations of these points are drawn, an image starts to emerge from seemingly random points being drawn, from chaos, from disorder. This complex yet orderly figure shows its face. From drawing a few points and following certain rules, chaos can form order. It's a fractal, they're infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across any scale. This shows that, with enough time, random actions can have serious long-term effects. The butterfly effect isn't exactly how you'd expect science to be. Physics, math, and many other scientific fields are based on predictability. You know, predicting the orbit of planets in order to send satellites and probes there. Or predicting the odds of an asteroid hitting the Earth. The butterfly effect is the complete opposite. It's a model that exposes the flaws in other models. It says that without a perfect knowledge of initial conditions, any prediction is basically useless. But although the butterfly effect exposes flaws in other models, it also brings to light the impact that everything, including each of us, has. Jonas Salk is credited for having found the first vaccines for polio. Had he not discovered that at the time he did, the entire population of the planet today would be vastly different. Some people wouldn't have been born. Entire family lines may have been cut off due to the lack of a vaccine. Perhaps some of the largest companies today would not have been created if it weren't for this specific event happening at this specific time. 
During the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Russian nuclear-armed submarine was stationed off the coast of Cuba. American ships detected the submarine and began using depth charges to signal that the submarine should surface. The crew on board, though, took these depth charges to be bombs. The captain of the ship believed that war had broke out between the United States and the Soviet Union and ordered a nuclear torpedo to be sent immediately. Everyone agreed, except for one officer, Vasily Arkhipov. Without a unanimous vote, no action could be taken, and thus World War III was prevented. This one man's decision is the reason that the United States and Russia today aren't nuclear wastelands. The butterfly effect affects everything. Do you really have control of your life? Like, everything? No, but you and I have huge effects on the world as well. The butterfly effect is not to get leverage, it's not saying that every small thing always has a big impact. If that were true, then in a way you could manipulate it. Think of it like Jenga. You take away a certain block and things can be just fine. But another block, that one special block, if removed, causes everything else to fall apart. The reality is you have no idea what thing, or what block, will change your future. So everything has a say in it. For example, you watching this video will take up about 10 minutes of your day, whether it's for a good reason or not. Could me watching a movie, or listening to a song, getting a video idea from it, researching it, writing it, editing it, and uploading it to where you see it on your YouTube feed at a specific time prevent something bad from happening to you? Maybe you watching this video prevented you from going to the store 10 minutes early, where if you had left 10 minutes ago, a car that runs a red light would smash into you in an intersection, killing you. It's a scary thought, but it's a possibility. Someone recently messaged me and said that they had saw someone watching one of my videos in their classroom right next to them. They started to talk, become friends, and now they're dating. If YouTube wasn't a platform, if I hadn't had that specific video idea, that wouldn't have happened, and maybe those two people would have never met. But it goes much further than that. Everything has led you and I to this very moment, literally everything. Because the universe exists, because the universe is expanding, and because the temperature of the universe was just right to the point that stellar nurseries can form stars, without those stars, we wouldn't have supernovas. Without supernovas, we wouldn't have iron. Without iron, we couldn't exist. Every day you breathe, I hope, and when you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide, through the help of plants and photosynthesis, creates more oxygen. Oxygen that people hundreds of years from now might breathe. Everything you do, no matter how small it is, will change the future in one way or another. People who lived hundreds of years ago have had an effect on the world as it is today. The things you do today will ripple throughout time. The small things you create today can be the big things that the next generation builds upon. In a way, you can live forever. So the next time something big happens in your life, just think. It didn't happen by accident. I love a lot of things. Some people love sunshine and rainbows. Some love the warmth of summer and the chill of winter. Others love the smell of hot coffee in the morning and the coziness of their bed at night. Some love to travel and go on crazy adventures. According to the dictionary, love is a mix of emotions, behaviors, and beliefs associated with strong feelings of affection, protectiveness, warmth, and respect for a person, or a thing, or even an idea. But can we really define love? How do we explain a word that you can use to describe what you feel for everything, from people, to cars, to intangible ideas? To fully understand what love is, we have to look at the ancient Greeks. Instead of one all-encompassing word, the ancient Greeks used seven different words to explain love in its many different forms. Eros, which means passionate love, is the most common type of love we see in our world today. It's fueled by a desire for pleasure. It's love at first sight, seeing someone's physical appearance and immediately getting attracted to them, even without knowing their first name. Most romantic relationships start like this. It's passionate. It can even be a bit obsessive. But love like this is confusing. It's the age-old question of love versus lust. Both lust and eros come with intense physical attraction and a strong desire to be close to the person, even if you just met them. Some people like to differentiate them by the length of time they stay around. If it was a fleeting emotion, it was lust. But then, if it lingered around like the best man at a wedding, then it was definitely love. 
But is that really true? And if it is, then is love simply lust that has stayed around for long enough? If lust simply becomes love, how long does it take for the switch to happen? At what point does lust become love? It's a complex question, and you don't normally give it much thought, so I'll do it for you. According to science and human biology, there are three stages to falling in love, and it all starts with stage one, lust. It's driven by testosterone for men and estrogen in women. So when does lust become love? Well, that's stage two. When we start feeling a sense of a high, when we see them or speak to them or even just think about them. A high similar to the feeling you'd get from drugs or alcohol. When we start to feel a sense of euphoria when we're around them. When testosterone and estrogen are replaced by dopamine, making us happy and excited. Adrenaline triggering our fight or flight. And norepinephrine keeping us alert. This is why falling in love feels like an addictive rush. Like you're driving at 120 miles per hour with no brakes in your car. Your palms are sweaty, your knees are weak, and your arms are heavy. Your heart is racing. Love is this feeling. Sometimes love doesn't start with lust. It starts with friendship. Knowing someone well enough that you can predict their reaction to every situation. Love is intimacy. It's authentic. It's kind. It's warm. It's encouraging. Love is the best friend you've known since you were a child. It's always wanting the best for the other person. Selfless goodwill. In today's world, philia is dying. We have millions of followers and subscribers, but very few friends. We have a multitude of people seeing the perfect view of our lives, everything we want them to see, but no one who is welcome to see what's behind the curtains. Philia is a sense of camaraderie. It's calling someone brother or sister, even when they're not related to you by blood. Love is loyalty, sacrifice, and vulnerability. Love is a choice. Love is not always serious. Love is not always permanent. And when it's fleeting, love is not always lust. Ludus describes a love that is built on infatuation, flirtation, and fun. Sometimes love is simply having a crush on someone and acting on it. It's going out for drinks with a friend and acting like a romantic couple for the night only. It's random kids pushing each other on swings in the playground, basking in that joy that their friends are having alongside them. It's going to the club and dancing with strangers, or singing karaoke in a room full of people you've just met. Sometimes love is casual, exciting, fun. It doesn't need any obligations or implications to be love. Love doesn't need physical attraction to be love. Love doesn't even need friendship to be love. Love simply is. We often say that love involves commitment, time, mutual trust, and acceptance between two people. But is that really the case? Because none of this exists between a mother and her child. But love does. The truth is that sometimes we can love someone even when we don't like them. If you have any siblings, I'm sure you'll understand the concept a lot. The Greeks called it storge, unconditional familial love. The kind of kinship love that only exists between family members, and of course, Family does not mean you have to be tied by blood. Lifelong friends who become family, adopted children, step-parents, when we consider someone our family, we often develop a need to protect them, even when they might not be the nicest people to hang around with. Storage is a strange type of love. Most times when we love someone, we are drawn closer to them. We want to spend all of our free time with them, go on adventures with them, laugh, smile, cry, do everything with them. But sometimes love is wanting to go home, even when you might not talk to the people there very much. It's simply a sense of security, like a weighted blanket. This love is being able to give someone a kidney without hesitation, but not your phone's charger. Even when in truth, only one of those is easily replaceable. And this strange feeling is not only towards people, it's the same for sports teams and fans. Every year you cheer for your team, every year they break your heart. Yet the very next year, you glue back the millions of pieces and wear the badge with the pride chanting, this year will be our year. 
Because love is unconditional. It's not dependent on who the person is or what they can give to you. Love is a one-way ticket. It's loving someone even when they might not have the ability to love you back. Aristotle once said, All friendly feelings for others are an extension of a man's feelings for himself. If you don't love yourself, you can never truly love others. This is why Philaudio, the love of oneself, is something we shouldn't take for granted. Love is not just what you can do for others, it's also what you can do for you. So go out and give yourself a treat once in a while. You don't have to have achieved anything or crossed any milestone before you celebrate yourself. Just like others don't necessarily have to do anything before you love them, you don't either. Love is when you can stop comparing yourself to others. When you forgive yourself for your past mistakes and stop judging yourself for things that are beyond your control. Love is when you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and be proud of the person staring right back at you. Love is leaving toxic relationships and not feeling obligated to stay no matter who they are or how important they've been to you in the past. It's choosing yourself over and over again and protecting yourself the way you would protect anyone else. Love is being kind to yourself, in your thoughts, in your words, and in your actions. Because only when we truly love ourselves can we be able to love others. Love lasts for a lifetime. Love is to have and to hold, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do you part. Love is committed and compassionate. It's accepting each other's differences and learning to compromise. Love is taking out all the broken pieces and putting them together again, instead of throwing them all out. Love is everlasting, rooted in romantic feelings and compassion. So is love a feeling, or a choice? If love is a choice, why do we never know we're falling in love with someone until we are? Why can't we ever say to ourselves, I want to fall in love with this person, and just do it? On the other hand, if love is a feeling, then there is no basis for wedding vows. There is no basis for the promise that we'll love each other forever. Because feelings come and go and usually they are beyond our control. The only way we can judge that love will remain forever is when we decide that it will. Is love a feeling or a choice? Well, it's both. Falling in love is a feeling, but staying in love is a decision. It's telling them you love them even on the worst days. It's saying to them, I don't know how we'll get through this, except that it'll be together. Love is being vulnerable even when we don't feel like it. Love is holding the roses without being scared of getting pricked by its thongs. Love is an amazing feeling in the beginning, but for love to last a lifetime, it has to evolve into a commitment of never letting this person go for as long as they let you. Love is giving to charity and helping strangers in need. Love is empathy towards humanity. It's fighting for change even when you might not be directly affected by the issues. Love is altruistic, selflessly caring for humans, animals, and even Mother Earth itself. Love doesn't expect anything in return for its actions. Love itself is the reward. Love serves as the foundation for societies and communities, without which we cannot thrive. Scientists have always battled with the concept of love. Some believe that love is a basic human emotion, like anger or sadness or joy. However, some others believe that love is simply a cultural phenomenon, something we are drawn towards as a result of societal expectations and pressures. But nothing could be further from the truth. If love is simply a cultural phenomenon, it wouldn't exist in all cultures of the world, and the fact that it does suggests that, in truth, there is something innate about love something biological about its experience. If love is fundamental to the human experience, then we must ask, what is the point of love? Why do we love? Is it for parents to be able to bear with their kids long enough for them to attain maturity? Or perhaps it's for mates to remain together for as long as is necessary to raise the next generation of humans? Does love exist to create a sense of community and camaraderie that is necessary for a herd community like ours to exist? We might never know why love exists or what ultimate purpose it serves, 
but we do know how important it is. The longest study on happiness showed that the people who end their life happy are not the ones who are the richest, or the ones who are the most healthy, or the ones who never made a mistake in their lives. The happiest people are those who are surrounded by the most love. Love from spouses, love from children and grandchildren, love from friends, love from religious organizations and communities. To fully understand just how important love is, we need to juxtapose its experience with the pain of loneliness. Not having that someone to share your inner monologue with because your thoughts are too petty or intense, random or full of anxiety, or too scary to share with just anyone. You can't rant, you can't scream, you can't fully express your feelings of obsession over your favorite passions, or rage about your most heartbreaking moments. Constantly having to filter our thoughts through the lenses of politeness and political correctness. Being looked at but not being seen. Being heard but not being listened to. It's dreadful. We've all been there. If love is so important, why do we not make it the center of our lives? Why do we chase everything else but to love we say, stop searching and it'll find you? You see, the truth is that love doesn't always find you and sometimes you have to search it out. So to those chasing love, listen. In Plato's dialogue, The Symposium, Aristophanes the playwright explains love the way many of us chasing love think of it. In the beginning, humans were all androgynous with double the parts we have now, including two faces turned in opposite directions. This physical form made humans so powerful that they became a threat to the gods. So Zeus cut them in two, one male and one female. And since every human has longed to be rejoined with their other half, like two pieces of a puzzle, two halves of a whole. Although this is just a myth, it opens up the curtain to why we love the way we do. We often fall in love with people who think would complete us. People who so perfectly fit together the pieces of our heart's puzzle. People who complement our shortcomings and give us hope for the things we are most insecure about. We love in part with the hope of completion. We all have a deep-rooted need to blossom, and we can only hope this person is the rain at the end of summer. But the truth is, we're already complete. In us are the two parts of a whole. So when people say, stop searching for love, don't take that as a message to stop trying. Take that as a lesson to stop searching for completion in another person. At the end of the day, only when you truly love yourself and completely understand the weight that that carries, can you love others the way they deserve to be? It all starts, and it all ends, with you. Here is an apple, and here's a banana. Pick one. Whichever one you picked, it was your decision completely. This is what we call free will. It's the idea that we are the sole authors of our destiny. That in the face of multiple choices, whatever decision we make is completely down to us. We have the power of free choice. But what if I told you that free will is a myth? That we are all just a group of atoms who will react to a particular stimulus in a way that can be predetermined? If you picked a banana at the beginning of the video, and we go back in time, if free will truly exists, you should be able to change your mind and pick the apple instead. But what if I told you that if we go back in time under the exact same circumstances, you'll pick the banana again? What if I told you that I can actually tell which of these two options you're going to pick 300 milliseconds before you actually pick it, with 100% accuracy? In the 1980s, Benjamin Libid, a physiologist, used an EEG, an electroencephalogram, to show that you can read and tell that somebody is about to move, 300 milliseconds before they decide in their conscious mind to actually move. This means that before we decide that we want to move our bodies, it's already been decided for us in our subconscious, and we only think that we made the decision ourselves after it's already been made. In a similar study, participants were asked to press one of the two buttons while looking at a clock with a random sequence of letters on a screen. With the use of fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, they discovered that two of the participants' brain regions showed what button they would press 7 to 10 seconds before they consciously made that decision. The results of this research only proves one thing. A few seconds before you pick the banana or the apple, your brain makes that decision for you. 
It is after this decision has been made deep in your subconscious that your brain becomes aware of it and we become convinced that we are in the process of making that decision. Because the brain is like the heart, we don't tell it what to do, it just does. So in reality, consciously making a decision, the experience we call free will, is actually an illusion. It's simply a visualization of events that the brain has already set in motion. It tells you what the brain has decided to do. For as long as society has existed, we've understood the role of surrounding influences on our decision making. With idioms like, it takes a village to raise a child, and you are the product of your environment. We understand that to a great extent, our upbringing, our parents, the society we grew up in, all of these influence our decision making process. If someone is born religious, it's not crazy to think that they'll be religious throughout their lives. Taking it a step further, things like genetics also play a huge role in our choices. Charles Darwin in The Theory of Evolution brought forward the idea that if species do indeed evolve, then things like intelligence must be hereditary. Intelligence is a trait that helps us make better decisions, and while you can study hard to know more than the average person, for the most part, how intelligent you are is not entirely up to you. So some people cannot make certain intelligent choices, not because they don't want to, but because their genes are limited. In that instance, would you say that the person has the freedom to make those intelligent choices? Because in reality, they do not. Their fates are predetermined by their genes. How can we all truly have the freedom to decide our fate when we're not dealt equal cards from the start? And it's not just the cards we're dealt, it's also the ability to play those cards. Some are simply born better bluffers than others. When you look at the concept of free will critically, the whole idea seems to crumble pretty quickly. In fact, researchers have come to the conclusion that believing in free will is like believing in religion. Neither of them agree with the laws of physics. Think about it. If free will truly exists, and if choice is not just a chemical process, then why can things like alcohol and antipsychotics completely change a person's behavior? Even worse, we've seen brain tumors turn people from pediatricians to pedophiles. Domenico Mattiello was once a respected pediatrician. For 30 years, he was loved by his patients and adored by their parents and everyone in the society. In a shocking turn of events, however, in 2012, he began facing trial after being accused of making pedophilic advances towards his female patients. Neuroscientific research showed that Mattiello had a 4-inch tumor growing at the base of his brain that changed his behavior. In 2002, a similar thing happened to an American schoolteacher. He suddenly started having pedophilic urges towards his stepdaughter and was arrested. Then it was discovered that he had an egg-sized tumor growing in the part of his brain that was supposed to be responsible for decision making. After the tumor got removed, the man's pedophilic urges stopped completely and he was able to return to his family. If free will exists, why can removing a tumor change a person's choice? Is it then possible that by altering brain chemistry or physical composition, we can completely change a person's beliefs, ideologies, and choices without the person being able to do anything about it? In more recent years, Lawyers have started using MRI scans to help plead the case of their clients. With neuroscientific research proving that brain tumors and malfunction cause them to commit their crimes, it's difficult to argue against it. Because if they did not have the freedom to choose to do something else, then why would you give them the heaviest punishment for actions they could do nothing about? Brian Dugan was facing execution in the state of Illinois after he pleaded guilty to murdering a 10-year-old girl. However. MRI scans revealed that he had mental malfunctions that affected his decision-making process. His lawyers pleaded with the court to spare him the capital punishment because, in reality, can we really say that it was his fault? If malfunctions in his brain caused him to do what he did, then he didn't have the free will to make a better decision. While he was on death row, his case continued to get argued and, as a result, the state of Illinois abolished capital punishment. Some scientists who still want to cling on to the idea of free will argue that while it's true that the subconscious makes decisions for the conscious, we still have the free will to shape the unconscious world. And on first glance, this makes a lot of sense. You can read a book and an idea gets into your subconscious. Then, in the face of a choice, the idea you've read floats back out of your subconscious, forming your conscious decision. However, there's a flaw in that idea. It's much like a paradox, because where then does the desire to change your subconscious by reading a book come from? Desire much like choice, comes from the subconscious. So a conscious effort to shape your subconscious is actually a subconscious effort to change your subconscious. 
The biggest obstacle the idea of free will, or lack thereof, faces is morality. If morality is based on free will, and free will doesn't exist, then what happens to morality? What happens to every other man-made institution that has been designed around the idea of free will? When faced with questions like these, many people immediately fall into a trap of fatalism. Fatalism is the idea that we are completely powerless in the universe's game. People who think like this believe that since we are not completely in charge of our destiny, we're completely at its mercy. It's random and not up to us. Then they become a lot less happy and start slacking in their relationships. They stop trying to be good people or uphold any moral standards, and overall they start to have a lower sense of fulfillment in life. But we don't have to fall into that trap. The scientists who champion the idea of the absence of free will would rather explain it philosophically as determinism rather than fatalism. Determinism is the idea that all events are predetermined by existing causes. That everything that will happen can be explained through the clockwork laws of cause and effect. It doesn't mean that we are completely powerless and simply at the mercy of what's to come. It simply gives us a different way to look at everything that happens around us. According to the government of the United Kingdom, more than half the people in prison have a brain injury. Doesn't that tell a scary story? Understanding the true concept of free will will help us realize that those people are no different from us. They're not worse humans, and many times, they're just there because of a combination of bad events that were totally out of their control. In the same way, with deterministic thinking, we would also show more humility when talking about our achievements because now we understand that we are simply a product of our past experiences. It helps us to have empathy for people who are not in a similar position as we are, and it helps us to reduce our sense of entitlement. If the people in higher positions in society do not attribute all their success to their personal efforts alone, they're more likely to do more for others. They're more likely to help and to give back to others, hoping they might be able to recreate the factors that help them succeed. If you're getting scared or confused right now, I totally get it. Even the scientists who have been studying this for decades have found it very disturbing. It's a difficult thing to wrap your head around because it goes against everything society is built around. Free will is the basis of our society. It's what determines who is right and who is wrong, who gets the praise and who deserves to be punished. It tells us that a man who killed another man deserves to spend the rest of his life in prison, and that someone who works hard deserves to live a good life. And that's the fear of spreading the absence of free will message. Many scientists believe that if enough people are aware of this idea, it could literally end society as we know it. Because why would someone else risk his life to save another person if after he's done it, people will only say, well, he didn't decide himself to do it, so he doesn't deserve any praise. The reality is, praise and punishment are two huge factors that help influence our decisions. So if we remove them from our society, we pave the way for fewer good deeds and much worse ones. It's a strange dilemma to be in, because although the truth is that we do not have free will, believing that we do is actually a lot better for us. This is the concept of illusionism, that although free will is an illusion, it's one that we must keep up with. Because faced with the choice between truth and good, it benefits the most of us to always choose good. So next time you see a homeless person down the street, don't just roll your eyes and judge the person. Understand that there are a multitude of factors, many of which they might not have been able to control that cause them to be where they are. Be humble about what you have and what you've achieved, because just a tiny less intelligence in your DNA and you might not have made that one decision that changed your life. Know that you do not have free will, at least how you imagine it, and you're just lucky your mixture of atoms makes the right decisions. But immediately forget that. Forget everything I said for the past 10 minutes, and act like every decision is yours completely. Because only then will you be able to make the decisions that can truly change a life. Some of them very likely have planets, and therefore I can imagine civilizations immensely beyond the capabilities of our own. NASA just announced the discovery of 500 new planets. They're all orbiting other stars. That's no, is it? It's I do, I don't understand. But if there's another thing... Our place in the universe is relatively quiet. We have an average star orbited by eight planets, one of which contains us. For every grain of sand on Earth, there's 10,000 stars up in the sky. To be exact, sorta, there's between 10 to the 22 and 10 to the 24 total stars. Let's say that 5% of those stars are like our own sun. That leaves 500 billion, billion sun-like stars. Alright, cool. So let's say that one in every five of those stars have a planet in the Goldilocks zone. 
a region around a star that can allow for liquid water, and life as we know it, to exist. That leaves 100 billion billion Earth-like planets out there. Okay, good. Out of these planets, let's say that 1% of them actually have life show up. Then, every single grain of sand on Earth would then represent an Earth-like exoplanet with potential life. Using this math, there's about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, meaning that there's over 1 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. If 1% of those planets have life show up, then there's possibly between 100,000 and 1 million civilizations somewhere in our galaxy. SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been searching for these signals for decades, but out of all of these possible civilizations, we've heard back from exactly zero. So, where is everybody? The Fermi Paradox addresses this exact question. If there's so many stars out there, if there's so many planets that are like Earth, why haven't we found them yet? Or why haven't they found us? Planets are actually really common in the universe. In just the past couple of years, our knowledge of habitable exoplanets, planets like Earth that exist outside of our solar system, have shot up drastically. We're now aware of around 3,800 exoplanets, some of which could possibly harbor life. The TRAPPIST-1 system is thought to have seven habitable planets orbiting a star about the size of Jupiter. The worlds are rocky, they have water, Earth is just like them. Okay, so if there's all these planets like Earth that could have life, why hasn't at least one other civilization other than our own been detected? Even though we continue to search for life every day, we've been acting like it already exists for decades. For example, when we first went to the moon, the returning astronauts weren't able just to walk around and go to press conferences like they do today, but instead they were locked in quarantine for weeks. Why? Well, it was assumed that if there was life on the moon, not developed life, but bacteria and microbes, then that could pose a serious threat to life back home and potentially wipe us off the face of the earth. Seriously. It was a serious enough issue and concern that the practice was continued throughout the Apollo program up until Apollo 15, when we realized we were okay. But that doesn't account for humans contaminating other moons or planets. There's quite literally thousands of pounds of junk just lying around on the moon. Although it's unlikely, it is possible that there could be bacteria on those objects that may be able to live under those circumstances, and we may have provided the moon its first life forms. The reason why we send satellites into the atmospheres of planets to burn up after we're done with them is for this exact reason. To prevent us from spreading ourselves places we shouldn't be. As bad as it sounds, every prediction we've ever made about the universe in the past has ended up being wrong in some way or another. There's been about 100 billion people throughout the entirety of humanity's existence. Almost all of them died without knowing what the planets actually were, what the universe is or was. 99% of all species on Earth have died already. Are we going to be the next one? Hundreds of years ago, we believed in a geocentric theory and thought that everything in the universe revolved around us. We believed the Earth was flat, but today we obviously know these things are the furthest from the truth. So based on our track record, it would be dumb to assume that we're the only life in the universe. Frank Drake thought the same thing. He thought, there's absolutely no way we're alone in the universe. There must be a way to calculate where everyone is, right? And from that simple question, we now have what is known as the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation breaks down all the necessary steps and requirements for a civilization to exist and thrive on a galactic level, allowing for us to detect them. It breaks down the search step by step, and at the end, we're left with the number of civilizations out there, waiting to be found. This is the Drake Equation. In a single line, seven variables, when multiplied together, give us a way of measuring how many possible civilizations could exist in our galaxy at this very instant. It's an actual way of calculating what we did at the start of the video, and there's terms for each step. It's a little daunting, but I'll break it down. N is the number of civilizations in our galaxy that we have a chance of talking to. This is what we're trying to figure out. Our star is the average rate of star formation in our galaxy. Now we don't know the exact number of stars that form every year, but we do know the amount of solar masses that form every year. It's about three. So every year, about three average sized stars form. Luckily, our sun is a pretty average star, so it's a good way to view it. It could be one huge star or ten smaller stars. We don't know for sure. 
but this term in the equation is the one that we're the most certain of. F sub p is the fraction of those stars that have planets. This number isn't certain, but some people have estimated that it's somewhere between 10 and 50%. Not super accurate, but it's a start. N sub e is the average number of planets that could potentially support life. So first we find the stars, second we find the planets, third we find the planets out of those that could support life. As I said at the start of the video, about 1 in every 5 stars have a planet in the habitable zone, so this is pretty certain as well. F sub L is where things start to get a little bit messy. F sub L is the fraction of planets that actually develop life at some point. Our data on life is really, really small, and by really small I mean us. We have one planet's worth of information on life out of the billions of billions of planets out there in the sky. We're just going off the data that we have, but what if extraterrestrial life doesn't function even close to the way that we do? It's possible, and I think quite likely, that life beyond Earth doesn't always need water or oxygen or sunlight at all. They don't have to function the way humans do. There's trillions of planets in the universe with trillions of different living conditions, so it's only fair to assume that there's possibly trillions of circumstances that allow alien beings to survive. So F sub L is hard to determine. F sub I is the fraction of planets with life that can actually form civilizations like we have. Again, our data is limited to us and only us. Something I really think about a lot is, if we live on such an average planet in an average galaxy around an average star, how did we get so lucky to be the only life to exist? If everything else around us is average, why did the anomaly known as life pop up here? Or maybe life in general isn't an anomaly, but just intelligent life is. Life that is able to ask the kind of questions like, are we alone? Out of all the species on Earth, us humans are the only ones who have developed the language. Alien methods of communication might not even be imaginable by us. They might not even have language or gather information visually or through the senses that we have, or even have any way of conveying things to species other than its own. It's like humans trying to understand and speak whale. I don't know how to, and I don't know anyone else that does. The same logic may apply to extraterrestrial beings and how they communicate. How many other life forms on Earth actually have verbal means of communication other than us? When we discover ancient languages, we have ways to decipher them. We have ways to make connections to other languages, we know how sentences are structured in various ways. With alien languages, there's nothing to refer to. We can refer to our own languages, sure, but cross-referencing entire civilizations on opposite ends of the galaxy with our own human language seems counterintuitive. F sub C is the fraction of civilizations that develop technology that can be detected. We, again, are the only examples of this. Let's say the Earth was created one year ago. Humans would then only be about 10 minutes old. The Industrial Revolution would have happened only two seconds ago. For the majority of human history, we have had literally zero ways to even consider contacting alien life. It's a very, very recent thing. We've been broadcasting radio waves into space for the past 100 years. But humanity has been around for as long as 1 million years. Out of our entire existence, only 0.0001% of that time have we even been able to conceivably contact aliens. Also keep in mind, radio waves are the only way that we've tried so far. In 100 or 200 years, we may find another way of contacting extraterrestrial life that could work millions of times better than radio waves. This could also be a reason why we haven't heard anything back. It would be like trying to talk to someone across the world via carrier pigeon while everyone else is using the internet. You would just look stupid. See, we expect all civilizations to be using the same kind of technology that we do. The only problem is we're either A, the first to get technology of our scale, or B, we've fallen behind and everyone else ahead of us is only getting more and more advanced. However, if they are able to detect our radio waves, they may have already found them. Discovery's four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. See, the last term in the Drake equation is L. It tells us how long a civilization lasts. It represents how long we have to be found before it's too late. Extraterrestrial civilizations may send out signals for a long time until they stop, or destroy themselves, or find a better way to live, a life in a simulation perhaps. The longer L is, the more advanced the civilization becomes. The Kardashev scale comes in handy here. I made an entire video on this topic, it's really bad, but I'll explain the important parts here. First, a civilization needs to find a way to take over its planet. This is called a Type 1 civilization. We are on our way there, we're at about 0.72 at the moment. A Type 2 civilization is capable of harnessing the power of its entire host star. See, the further away you are from a star, the less energy you get from it. 
Earth only gets maybe one billionth of a percent of the sun's energy at any moment. Many structures have been proposed to somehow harness the sun's energy, but we won't be there for a very, very long time. The third stage for a civilization is, you guessed it, a Type 3 civilization. This civilization has conquered the galaxy and has access to any and every planet. But from our knowledge, there isn't even one of those civilizations out there that are detectable. And that doesn't make sense. See, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Earth has only been around for maybe a third of that. There's been at least 5 billion years prior to Earth coming into existence that could allow for civilizations to have risen and also fallen. But yet, we see nothing. If you could build a device, a huge ship, that could travel at 10% the speed of light, you could cross the galaxy in 600,000 years. I know, it sounds like a long time, but in comparison to the Milky Way's at least 10 billion year old age, 600,000 years is literally nothing. All it takes is for one species to do this, and they could cover the entire galaxy. So if it's that easy, why haven't we seen it yet? Well, it might be a good thing. Because that would mean that the Great Filter is in front of us. There may be other life in the universe, but there's barriers that we all have to overcome. The Great Filter theory helps explain this very well. Imagine that there's one million civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, but not all of them can thrive to the point that they take over the galaxy. There's barriers in the way. These barriers are things that new life forms and civilizations must overcome. The first barrier might be multicellular life, and maybe that's an easy barrier to cross. Okay, next barrier. The ability to have thoughts and a consciousness. Next, maybe we have to understand basic technology. Okay, that's fine, we're good at that. Next, discover time travel. Okay, not so easy. We're kinda stuck. See, there's things that prevent us from progressing, moving forward and becoming a galactic civilization, but we don't know what those things are. There's hundreds of billions of planets in the Milky Way, but when we look for other life, there's nothing. Where's it all at? Well, the Great Filter Theory shows that there's certain steps that the species must get past in order to take over their planet, solar system, galaxy, and so on, just like the Kardashev scale suggests. One, or perhaps multiple of these filters, are extremely hard, or maybe impossible, to get past. The question is, have we already gotten past that barrier, or does it lie in front of us? If it's behind us, then good. We've passed a nearly impossible step in building a civilization, and we may be one of, or even the first advanced civilization in the universe. If it's ahead of us, then we have our work cut out for us. For the majority of human history, the planet's fate was up to events that humans couldn't control. For example, large asteroids that wiped the planet of its inhabitants. But today, actually only in the past 80 years, we've developed technology capable of ending human civilization at a moment's notice. We're working on AGI that will then lead to superintelligent AI. These could be some of the barriers we must get past, and it may be where many civilizations fail. If we find an advanced civilization that has died in the process of advancing, then the Great Filter is in front of us, and this isn't good. The Great Filter is a challenge that wipes out almost every species that encounters it. It's not just one that kills off 99% of a population. That would give them a chance to regrow and reconquer that barrier. This would kill 100% of every civilization that has ever existed, and leave no chance for repairs. As with many other things that people believe to be stronger than them, things like superintelligent AI or aliens, many people tend to fear them. Historically, whenever a stronger species or civilization, or, for the future's sake, technology arose, it almost always resulted in the weaker party being wiped out. For example, humans and Neanderthals. Or more recently, the discovery of North America. Perhaps this is only human nature, but based off of what we know from the past, first contact with aliens might be the most dangerous thing humanity has ever faced. A really important question arises here. If we do hear from or detect another civilization, should we let them know that we heard it? The futurist half of me says yes, of course, but the other half of me says maybe not. This could be exactly what alien civilizations are doing right now. It's possible that they have detected us already, but instead of responding, they're observing and patiently waiting. Advanced alien species may just be observing us to see how we progress. Consider us a science experiment, but on a potentially galactic scale. I touched on this in my AI video, but I'll bring it up again here. When you're building or observing something or someone who could be multiple times more powerful than you are, you need to be careful. You want to observe and keep a close eye on how it progresses. AI could help us colonize the galaxy and meet other life forms, 
but it could also cause the extinction of our species. What happens if superintelligent AI sees extraterrestrial life as a threat and makes attempts to take it out? It'll probably fail, and that is one of the worst scenarios for us. One of our own creations, perhaps our best creation, is the cause for the extinction of our species. But with the case of AI that we're developing on our own planet, if it gets too powerful we'd just shut it off, right? Type 3 civilizations may be doing the same thing with us. They may be observing us to see how other life in the universe becomes powerful, and if we eventually get to that tipping point, whatever it may be, they may decide to put an end to their experiment. It sounds insane, but we do that here on Earth. There are parts of Earth that we could inhabit, but we don't just because it isn't convenient for us. Prime example, Antarctica. It's an entire continent that we don't colonize because it isn't convenient. It's frozen and just not super suitable for life. This could be how alien civilizations view Earth. They may have found us, realized that we aren't special at all, and moved on. For all we know, we may have already been visited by aliens, just not recently. With all the time before Earth's formation that may have allowed civilizations to form, there's a chance that one or maybe multiple of those civilizations have stumbled upon Earth during its infancy, when there was no life to be found. Modern humans have only been around for maybe 50,000 to 100,000 years, 100,000 years out of 4.5 billion is practically nothing. In an entire galaxy, there's bound to be places that just aren't worth colonizing. Why waste time and resources on colonizing a planet that won't benefit you in any way? Aliens wouldn't come to Earth without a reason, whether it's good or bad. Drake's equation is just that, an equation. The terms, mostly the last four, are educated guesses at best. That's all you can really do when trying to answer a question of this magnitude. There could be many, many more civilizations than we think. Or maybe we're the only one. If any of the values in Drake's equation end up being zero, that's it. We're alone. There's been many calculations made with the Drake equation, and it all comes down to how pessimistic or optimistic you are about the future. There have been calculations as high as a couple million civilizations in our galaxy, and there have been calculations that say we're alone and at the moment, they both hold value. Enrico Fermi did ask one of the most important questions humans have ever asked, but at the same time, Fermi was also a pioneer in the creation of nuclear weapons. The species that could inhabit the entire galaxy is also the same species that stands capable of almost completely wiping itself out at a moment's notice. We search every day for signals from other civilizations. We look for techno-signatures, signs of engineering, of things that just don't commonly appear in nature, like city lights from space. We search for those in other corners of the galaxy. We study biosignatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets to find elements that may show that life could exist. We sent out radio waves hoping to find aliens. In 1974, Frank Drake himself sent out the Arecibo message to the M13 star cluster. It's a string of information describing humanity in hopes that someone, or something, would find it. We send out satellites such as the Voyager crafts, with specific instructions of who we are, what we are, and where we are. We're doing all we can to find alien life while also giving them all the information they need to find us. We want so badly not to be the only ones in the universe that we don't even consider the possible consequences of us not being alone. Are we done or are we just getting started? I guess the better question is, are we closer to the beginning or the end of human existence? There's only a finite amount of space on Earth for life, and there's only one place we can go. Either way, the clock is ticking down. Time is against us, and I don't want to be around to see what happens when that clock hits zero. Life is hard. I bought a new pair of shoes the other day, walked outside into the rain, and ended up stepping into some mud. Now they're ruined, and